Novel of the White Powder My name is Lester. My father, Major General Wynn Lester, a distinguished officer of artillery, succumbed five years ago to a complicated liver complaint acquired in the deadly climate of India. A year later, my only brother Francis came home after an exceptionally brilliant career at the university and settled down with the resolution of a hermit to master what has well been called the great legend of the law. He was a man who seemed to live in utter indifference to everything that is called pleasure, and though he was handsomer than most men and could talk as merrily and wittily as if he were a mere vagabond, he avoided society and shut himself up in a large room at the top of the house to make himself a lawyer. Ten hours a day of hard reading was at first his allotted portion. From the first light in the east to the late afternoon, he remained shut up with his books, taking a hasty half-hour's lunch with me as if he grudged the wasting of the moments, and going out for a short walk when it began to grow dusk. I thought that such relentless application must be injurious, and tried to cajole him from the crabbed textbooks, but his ardor seemed to grow rather than diminish, and his daily tale of hours increased. I spoke to him seriously, suggesting some occasional relaxation, if it were but an idle afternoon with a harmless novel. But he laughed, and said that he read about feudal tenures when he felt in need of amusement, and scoffed at the notion of theaters or a month's fresh air. I confessed that he looked well, and seemed not to suffer from his labors, but I knew that such unnatural toil would take its revenge at last, and I was not mistaken. A look of anxiety began to lurk about his eyes, and he seemed languid, and at last he vowed that he was no longer in perfect health. He was troubled, he said, with a sensation of dizziness, and awoke now and then of nights from fearful dreams, terrified and cold with icy sweats. I am taking care of myself, he said, so you must not trouble. I passed the whole of yesterday afternoon in idleness, leaning back in that comfortable chair you gave me, and scribbling nonsense on a sheet of paper. No, no, I will not overdo my work. I shall be well enough in a week or two, depend upon it. Yet in spite of his assurances, I could see that he grew no better, but rather worse. He would enter the drawing-room with a face all miserably wrinkled and despondent, and endeavored to look gaily when my eyes fell on him, and I thought such symptoms of evil omen, and was frightened sometimes at the nervous irritation of his movements, and at glances which I could not decipher. Much against his will, I prevailed on him to have medical advice, and with an ill grace he called in our old doctor. Dr. Haberden cheered me after examination of his patient. There is nothing really much amiss, he said to me. No doubt he reads too hard and eats hastily, and then goes back again to his books in too great a hurry, and the natural consequence is some digestive trouble and a little mischief in the nervous system. But I think, I do indeed, Miss Lester, that we shall be able to set this all right. I have written him a prescription which ought to do great things, so you have no cause for anxiety. My brother insisted on having the prescription made up by a chemist in the neighborhood. It was an odd, old-fashioned shop, devoid of the studied coquetry and calculated glitter that makes so gay a show of the counters and shelves of the modern apothecary. But Francis liked the old chemist, and believed in the scrupulous purity of his drugs. The medicine was sent in due course, and I saw that my brother took it regularly after lunch and dinner. It was an innocent-looking white powder, of which a little was dissolved in a glass of cold water. I stirred it in, and it seemed to disappear, leaving the water clear and colorless. At first, Francis seemed to benefit greatly. The weariness vanished from his face, and he became more cheerful than he had ever been since the time when he left school. He talked gaily of reforming himself, and avowed to me that he had wasted his time. I have given too many hours to law, he said, laughing. I think you have saved me in the nick of time. Come, I shall be Lord Chancellor yet, but I must not forget life. You and I will have a holiday together before long. We will go to Paris and enjoy ourselves, and keep away from the Bibliothèque Nationale. I confessed my delight with the prospect. When shall we go, I said. I can start the day after tomorrow, if you like. 
Ah, that is perhaps a little too soon. After all, I do not know London yet, and I suppose a man ought to give the pleasures of his own country the first choice. But we will go off together in a week or two, so try and furbish up your French. I only know law French myself, and I am afraid that wouldn't do. We were just finishing dinner, and he quaffed his medicine with a parade of carousal as if it had been wine from some choicest bin. Has it any particular taste, I said. No, I should not know I was not drinking water. And he got up from his chair and began to pace up and down the room as if he were undecided as to what he should do next. Shall we have coffee in the drawing room, I said, or would you like to smoke? No, I think I will take a turn. It seems a pleasant evening. Look at the afterglow. Why, it is as if a great city were burning in flames, and down there between the dark houses it is raining blood fast, fast. Yes, I will go out. I may be in soon, but I shall take my key. So good night, dear, if I don't see you again. The door slammed behind him, and I saw him walk lightly down the street, swinging his Malacca cane, and I felt grateful to Dr. Haberden for such an improvement. I believe my brother came home very late that night, but he was in a merry mood the next morning. I walked on without thinking where I was going, he said, enjoying the freshness of the air, enlivened by the crowds, as I reached more frequented quarters. And then I met an old college friend, Orford, in the press of the pavement, and then, well, we enjoyed ourselves. I have felt what it is to be young and a man. I find I have blood in my veins, as other men have. I made an appointment with Orford for tonight. There will be a little party of us at the restaurant. Yes, I shall enjoy myself for a week or two, and hear the chimes at midnight. And then we shall go for our little trip together. Such was the transmutation of my brother's character, that in a few days he became a lover of pleasure, a careless and merry idler of western pavements a hunter out of snug restaurants, and a fine critic of fantastic dancing. He grew fat before my eyes, and said no more of Paris, for he had clearly found his paradise in London. I rejoiced and yet wondered a little, for there was, I thought, something in his gaiety that indefinitely displeased me, though I could not have defined my feeling. But by degrees there came a change. He returned still in the cold hours of the morning, but I heard no more about his pleasures, and one morning, as we sat at breakfast together, I suddenly looked into his eyes and saw a stranger before me. "'Oh, Francis!' I cried. "'Oh, Francis! Francis! What have you done?' And rending sobs cut the word short. I went weeping out of the room, for though I knew nothing, yet I knew all, and by some odd play of thought I remembered the evening when he first went abroad to prove his manhood and the picture of the sunset sky glowed before me, the clouds like a city in burning flames, and the rain of blood. Yet I did not battle with such thoughts, resolving that perhaps, after all, no great harm had been done, and in the evening at dinner I resolved to press him to fix a day for our holiday in Paris. We talked easily enough, and my brother had just taken his medicine, which he had continued all the while. I was about to begin my topic, when the words forming in my mind vanished, and I wondered for a second what icy and intolerable weights oppressed my heart and suffocated me as with the unutterable horror of the coffin lid nailed down on the living. We had dined without candles. The room had slowly grown from twilight to gloom, and the walls and corners were indistinct in the shadow. But from where I sat, I looked out into the street. And as I thought of what I would say to Francis, the sky began to flush and shine, as it had done on a well-remembered evening, and in the gap between two dark masses that were houses, an awful pageantry of flame appeared, lurid whirls of writhed cloud, the utter depths burning, gray masses like the fume blown from a smoking city, and an evil glory blazing far above shot with tongues of more ardent fire and below, as if there were a deep pool of blood. I looked down to where my brother sat facing me, and the words were shaped on my lips, when I saw his hand resting on the table. Between the thumb and forefinger of the closed hand there was a mark, a small patch about the size of a sixpence, and somewhat of the color of a bad bruise. Yet, by some sense I cannot define, 
I knew that what I saw was no bruise at all. Oh, if human flesh could burn with flame, and if that flame could be black as pitch, such was that before me. Without thought or fashioning words, gray horror shaped within me at the sight, and in an inner cell it was known to be a brand. For a moment the stained sky became dark as midnight, and when the light returned to me I was alone in the silent room, and soon after I heard my brother go out. Late as it was, I put on my bonnet and went to Dr. Haberden, and in his great consulting room, ill-lighted by a candle which the doctor brought in with him, with stammering lips, and a voice that would break in spite of my resolve, I told him all, from the day on which my brother began to take the medicine, down to the dreadful thing I had seen scarcely half an hour before. When I had done, the doctor looked at me for a minute, with an expression of great pity on his face. "'My dear Miss Lester,' he said, "'you have evidently been anxious about your brother. You have been worrying over him, I am sure. Come now, is it not so?' "'I certainly have been anxious,' I said. For the last week or two, I have not felt at ease. Quite so. You know, of course, what a queer thing the brain is. I understand what you mean, but I was not deceived. I saw what I have told you with my own eyes. Yes, yes, of course, but your eyes had been staring at that very curious sunset we had tonight. That is the only explanation. You will see it in the proper light tomorrow, I am sure. But remember, I am always ready to give any help that is in my power. Do not scruple to come to me, or send for me if you are in any distress. I went away, but little comforted, all confusion and terror and sorrow, not knowing where to turn. When my brother and I met the next day, I looked quickly at him, and noticed, with a sickening at heart, that the right hand, the hand on which I had clearly seen the patch as of a black fire, was wrapped up with a handkerchief. "'What is the matter with your hand, Francis?' I said in a steady voice. "'Nothing of consequence. I cut a finger last night, and it bled rather awkwardly, so I did it up roughly, to the best of my ability. I will do it neatly for you, if you like. No, thank you, dear. This will answer very well. Suppose we have breakfast. I am quite hungry.' We sat down, and I watched him. He scarcely ate or drank at all, but tossed his meat to the dog when he thought my eyes were turned away. There was a look in his eyes that I had never yet seen, and the thought flashed across my mind that it was a look that was scarcely human. I was firmly convinced that awful and incredible as was the thing I had seen the night before, yet it was no illusion, no glamour of bewildered sense, and in the course of the morning I went again to the doctor's house. He shook his head with an air puzzled and incredulous, and seemed to reflect for a few minutes. And you say he still keeps up the medicine. But why? As I understand, all the symptoms he complained of have disappeared long ago. Why should he go on taking the stuff when he is quite well? And, by the by, where did he get it made up? At Sacy's. I never send anyone there. The old man is getting careless. Suppose you come with me to the chemist's. I should like to have some talk with him. We walked together to the shop. Old Sacy knew Dr. Haberden and was quite ready to give any information. "'You have been sending that in to Mr. Lester for some weeks, I think on my prescription,' said the doctor, giving the old man a penciled scrap of paper. The chemist put on his great spectacles with trembling uncertainty, and held up the paper with a shaking hand. "'Oh, yes,' he said. "'I have very little of it left. It is rather an uncommon drug, and I have had it in stock some time. I must get in some more, if Mr. Lester goes on with it.' "'Kindly let me have a look at the stuff,' said Haberden, and the chemist gave him a glass bottle. He took out the stopper and smelt the contents, and looked strangely at the old man. "'Where did you get this?' he said, "'and what is it? For one thing, Mr. Sacy, it is not what I prescribed. Yes, yes, I see the label is right enough, but I tell you, this is not the drug.' "'I have had it a long time,' said the old man in feeble terror. "'I got it from Burbage's in the usual way. It is not prescribed often.' and I have had it on the shelf for some years. You see, there is very little left. You had better give it to me, said Haberden. I am afraid something wrong has happened. We went out of the shop in silence, the doctor carrying the bottle, neatly wrapped in paper, under his arm. Dr. Haberden, I said, when we had walked a little way. Dr. Haberden. 
Yes, he said, looking at me gloomily enough. I should like you to tell me what my brother has been taking twice a day for the last month or so. Frankly, Miss Lester, I don't know. We will speak of this when we get to my house. We walked on quickly, without another word, till we reached Dr. Haberden's. He asked me to sit down, and began pacing up and down the room, his face clouded over, as I could see, with no common fears. Well, he said at length, this is all very strange. It is only natural that Hugh should feel alarmed, and I must confess that my mind is far from easy. We will put aside, if you please, what you told me last night and this morning, but the fact remains that for the last few weeks Mr. Lester has been impregnating his system with a drug which is completely unknown to me. I tell you, it is not what I ordered, and what that stuff in the bottle really is remains to be seen. He undid the wrapper and cautiously tilted a few grains of the white powder onto a piece of paper and peered curiously at it. Yes, he said, it is the sulfate of quinine, as you say. It is flaky, but smell it. He held the bottle to me, and I bent over it. It was a strange, sickly smell, vaporous and overpowering, like some strong anesthetic. I shall have it analyzed, said Haberden. I have a friend who has devoted his whole life to chemistry as a science. Then we will have something to go upon. No, no, say no more about that other matter. I cannot listen to that and take my advice and think no more about it yourself. That evening, my brother did not go out as usual after dinner. I have had my fling, he said with a queer laugh, and I must go back to my old ways. A little law will be quite a relaxation after so sharp a dose of pleasure. And he grinned to himself, and soon after went up to his room. His hand was still all bandaged. Dr. Haberden called a few days later. I have no special news to give you, he said. Chambers is out of town, so I know no more about that stuff than you do, but I should like to see Mr. Lester if he is in. He is in his room, I said. I will tell him you are here. No, no, I will go up to him. We will have a little quiet talk together. I dare say that we have made a good deal of fuss about very little, for after all, whatever the white powder may be, it seems to have done him good. The doctor went upstairs, and standing in the hall, I heard his knock and the opening and shutting of the door, and then I waited in the silent house for an hour, and the stillness grew more and more intense as the hands of the clock crept round. Then there sounded from above the noise of a door shut sharply, and the doctor was coming down the stairs. His footsteps crossed the hall, and there was a pause at the door. I drew a long, sick breath with difficulty, and saw my face white in a little mirror, and he came in and stood at the door. There was an unutterable horror shining in his eyes. He steadied himself by holding the back of a chair with one hand. His lower lip trembled like a horse's, and he gulped and stammered unintelligible sounds before he spoke. I have seen that man, he began in a dry whisper. I have been sitting in his presence for the last hour. My God, and I am alive and in my senses. I, who have dealt with death all my life, and have dabbled with the melting ruins of the earthly tabernacle, but not this, oh, not this! And he covered his face with his hands, as if to shut out the sight of something before him. Do not send for me again, Miss Lester, he said with more composure. I can do nothing in this house. Goodbye. As I watched him totter down the steps and along the pavement towards his house, it seemed to me that he had aged by ten years since the morning. My brother remained in his room. He called out to me, in a voice I hardly recognized, that he was very busy and would like his meals brought to his door and left there. And I gave the order to the servants. From that day, it seemed as if the arbitrary conception we call time had been annihilated for me. I lived in an ever-present sense of horror, going through the routine of the house mechanically and only speaking a few necessary words to the servants. Now and then, I went out and paced the streets for an hour or two, and came home again. But whether I were without or within, my spirit delayed before the closed door of the upper room, and, shuddering, waited for it to open. I have said that I scarcely reckoned time, but I suppose it must have been a fortnight, after Dr. Haberden's visit, 
that I came home from my stroll a little refreshed and lightened. The air was sweet and pleasant, and the hazy form of green leaves floating cloud-like in the square and the smell of blossoms had charmed my senses, and I felt happier and walked more briskly. As I delayed a moment at the verge of the pavement, waiting for a van to pass by before crossing over to the house, I happened to look up at the windows, and instantly there was a rush and swirl of deep cold waters in my ears. My heart leapt up and fell down, down as into a deep hollow, and I was amazed with a dread and terror without form or shape. I stretched out a hand blindly through folds of thick darkness from the black and shadowy valley and held myself from falling while the stones beneath my feet rocked and swayed and tilted, and the sense of solid things seemed to sink away from under me. I had glanced up at the window of my brother's study, and at that moment the blind was drawn aside, and something that had life stared out into the world. Nay, I cannot say I saw a face or any human likeness. A living thing, two eyes of burning flame, glared at me and they were in the midst of something as formless as my fear, the symbol and presence of all evil and all hideous corruption. I stood shuddering and quaking as with the grip of a goo, sick with unspeakable agonies of fear and loathing, and for five minutes I could not summon force or motion to my limbs. When I was within the door, I ran upstairs to my brother's room and knocked. Francis, Francis, I cried, for heaven's sake, answer me. What is the horrible thing in your room? Cast it out, Francis, cast it from you. I heard a noise as of feet shuffling slowly and awkwardly, and a choking, gurgling sound, as if someone was struggling to find utterance, and then the noise of a voice, broken and stifled, and words that I could scarcely understand. There is nothing here, the voice said. Pray do not disturb me. I am not very well today. I turned away horrified and yet helpless. I could do nothing, and I wondered why Francis had lied to me, for I had seen the appearance beyond the glass too plainly to be deceived, though it was but the sight of a moment. And I sat still, conscious that there had been something else, something I had seen in the first flash of terror, before those burning eyes had looked at me. Suddenly, I remembered. As I lifted my face, the blind was being drawn back, and I had had an instant's glance of the thing that was moving it, and in my recollection I knew that a hideous image was engraved forever on my brain. It was not a hand, there were no fingers that held the blind, but a black stump that pushed it aside, the moldering outline and the clumsy movement as of a beast's paw had glowed into my senses before the darkling waves of terror had overwhelmed me as I went down quick into the pit. My mind was aghast at the thought of this, and of the awful presence that dwelt with my brother in his room. I went to his door and cried to him again, but no answer came. That night one of the servants came up to me and told me in a whisper that for three days food had been regularly placed at the door and left untouched. The maid had knocked, but had received no answer. She had heard the noise of shuffling feet that I had noticed. Day after day went by, and still my brother's meals were brought to his door and left untouched. And though I knocked and called again and again, I could get no answer. The servants began to talk to me. It appeared they were as alarmed as I. The cook said that when my brother first shut himself up in his room, she used to hear him come out at night and go about the house. And once, she said, the hall door had opened and closed again, but for several nights she had heard no sound. The climax came at last. It was in the dusk of the evening, and I was sitting in the darkening dreary room when a terrible shriek jarred and rang harshly out of the silence, and I heard a frightened scurrying of feet dashing down the stairs. I waited, and the servant maid staggered into the room and faced me, white and trembling. Oh, Miss Helen, she whispered. Oh, for the Lord's sake, Miss Helen, what has happened? Look at my hand, Miss. Look at that hand. I drew her to the window and saw there was a black, wet stain upon her hand. I do not understand you, I said. Will you explain to me? I was doing your room just now, she began. 
I was turning down the bedclothes, and all of a sudden there was something fell upon my hand, wet, and I looked up, and the ceiling was black and dripping on me. I looked hard at her and bit my lip. Come with me, I said. Bring your candle with you. The room I slept in was beneath my brother's, and as I went in, I felt I was trembling. I looked up at the ceiling and saw a patch, all black and wet, and a dew of black drops upon it, and a pool of horrible liquor soaking into the white bedclothes. I ran upstairs and knocked loudly. Oh, Francis, Francis, my dear brother, I cried, what has happened to you? And I listened. There was a sound of choking and a noise like water bubbling and regurgitating, but nothing else. And I called louder, but no answer came. In spite of what Dr. Haberden had said, I went to him. With tears streaming down my cheeks, I told him of all that had happened, and he listened to me with a face set hard and grim. For your father's sake, he said at last, I will go with you, though I can do nothing. We went out together. The streets were dark and silent, and heavy with heat, and a drought of many weeks. I saw the doctor's face white under the gas lamps, and when we reached the house, his hand was shaking. We did not hesitate, but went upstairs directly. I held the lamp, and he called out in a loud, determined voice, Mr. Lester, do you hear me? I insist on seeing you. Answer me at once. There was no answer, but we both heard that choking noise I have mentioned. Mr. Lester, I am waiting for you. Open the door this instant, or I shall break it down. And he called a third time in a voice that rang and echoed from the walls. Mr. Lester, for the last time, I order you to open the door. Ah, he said, after a pause of heavy silence, we are wasting our time here. Will you be so kind as to get me a poker, or something of the kind? I ran into a little room at the back where odd articles were kept, and found a heavy ads-like tool that I thought might serve the doctor's purpose. Very good, he said. That will do, I dare say. I give you notice, Mr. Lester, he cried loudly at the keyhole, that I am now about to break into your room. Then I heard the wrench of the ads, and the woodwork split and cracked under it. With a loud crash, the door suddenly burst open, and for a moment we started back aghast at a fearful screaming cry, no human voice, but as the roar of a monster that burst forth inarticulate and struck at us out of the darkness. Hold the lamp, said the doctor, and we went in and glanced quickly round the room. There it is, said Dr. Haberden, drawing a quick breath. Look, in that corner. I looked and a pang of horror seized my heart, as with a white-hot iron. There upon the floor was a dark and putrid mass, seething with corruption and hideous rottenness, neither liquid nor solid, but melting and changing before our eyes, and bubbling with unctuous oily bubbles like boiling pitch, and out of the midst of it shone two burning points like eyes, and I saw a writhing and stirring as of limbs and something moved and lifted up that might have been an arm. The doctor took a step forward, raised the iron bar, and struck at the burning points. He drove in the weapon and struck again and again in a fury of loathing. At last, the thing went quiet. A week or two later, when I had to some extent recovered from the terrible shock, Mr. Haberden came to see me. I have sold my practice, he began, and tomorrow I am sailing on a long voyage. I do not know whether I shall ever return to England. In all probability, I shall buy a little land in California and settle there for the remainder of my life. I have brought you this packet, which you may open and read when you feel able to do so. It contains the report of Dr. Chambers on what I submitted to him. Goodbye, Miss Lester. Goodbye. When he was gone, I opened the envelope. I could not wait, and proceeded to read the papers within. Here is the manuscript, and if you will allow me, I will read you the astounding story it contains. My dear Haberden, the letter began, I have delayed inexcusably in answering your question as to the white substance you sent me. To tell you the truth, I have hesitated for some time as to what course I should adopt for there is a bigotry 
and an orthodox standard in physical science as in theology, and I knew that if I told you the truth, I should offend rooted prejudices which I once held dear myself. However, I have determined to be plain with you, and first I must enter into a short personal explanation. You have known me, Haberden, for many years as a scientific man. You and I have often talked of our profession together, and discussed the hopeless gulf that opens up before the feet of those who think to attain the truth by any means whatsoever except the beaten way of experiment and observation in the sphere of material things. I remember the scorn with which you have spoken to me of men of science who have dabbled a little in the unseen, and have timidly hinted that perhaps the senses are not, after all, the eternal impenetrable bounds of all knowledge, the everlasting walls beyond which no human being has ever passed. We have laughed together heartily, and I think justly, at the occult follies of the day, disguised under various names, the mesmerisms, spiritualisms, materializations, theosophies, all the rabble rant of imposture, with their machinery of poor tricks and feeble conjuring, the true back parlor magic of shabby London streets. Yet, in spite of what I have said, I must confess to you that I am no materialist, taking the word, of course, in its usual signification. It is now many years since I have convinced myself, convinced myself, a skeptic, remember, that the old iron-bound theory is utterly and entirely false. Perhaps this confession will not wound you so sharply as it would have done twenty years ago, for I think you cannot have failed to notice that for some time hypotheses have been advanced by men of pure science which are nothing less than transcendental and I suspect that most modern chemists and biologists of repute would not hesitate to subscribe the dictum of the old schoolman, omnia exunt in mysterium, which means, I take it, that every branch of human knowledge, if traced up to its source and final principles, vanishes into mystery. I need not trouble you now with a detailed account of the painful steps which led me to my conclusions. A few simple experiments suggested a doubt as to my then standpoint, and a train of thought that rose from circumstances comparatively trifling brought me far. My old conception of the universe has been swept away, and I stand in a world that seems as strange and awful to me as the endless waves of the ocean seen for the first time, shining from a peak in Darien. Now I know that the walls of sense that seemed so impenetrable that seem to loom up above the heavens, and to be founded below the depths, and to shut us in forevermore, are no such everlasting impassable barriers as we fancied, but thinnest and most airy veils that melt away before the seeker, and dissolve as the early mist in the morning about the brooks. I know that you never adopted the extreme materialistic position. You did not go about trying to prove a universal negative, for your logical sense withheld you from that crowning absurdity. But I am sure that you will find all that I am saying strange and repellent to your habits of thought. Yet, Haberden, what I tell you is the truth, nay, to adopt our common language, the sole and scientific truth, verified by experience. And the universe is verily more splendid and more awful than we used to dream. The whole universe, my friend, as a tremendous sacrament, a mystic, ineffable force and energy, veiled by an outward form of matter, and man, and the sun, and the other stars, and the flower of the grass, and the crystal in the test tube, are each and every one as spiritual, as material, and subject to an inner working. You will perhaps wonder, Haberden, whence all this tends, but I think a little thought will make it clear. You will understand that from such a standpoint the whole view of things is changed, and what we thought incredible and absurd may be possible enough. In short, we must look at legend and belief with other eyes, and be prepared to accept tales that have become mere fables. Indeed, this is no such great demand. After all, modern science will concede as much in a hypocritical manner. You must not, it is true, believe in witchcraft, but you may credit hypnotism. Ghosts are out of date, but there is a good deal to be said for the theory of telepathy. 
give a superstition a Greek name and believe in it should almost be a proverb. So much for my personal explanation. You sent me, Haberton, a file, stoppered and sealed, containing a small quantity of a flaky white powder, obtained from a chemist who had been dispensing it to one of your patients. I am not surprised to hear that this powder refused to yield any results to your analysis. It is a substance which was known to a few many hundred years ago, but which I have never expected to have submitted to me from the shop of a modern apothecary. There seems no reason to doubt the truth of the man's tale. He had no doubt got, as he says, the rather uncommon salt you prescribed from the wholesale chemists, and it has probably remained on his shelf for twenty years, or perhaps longer. Here what we call chance and coincidence begin to work. During all these years, the salt in the bottle was exposed to certain recurring variations of temperature, variations probably ranging from 40 degrees to 80 degrees, and, as it happens, such changes, recurring year after year at irregular intervals, and with varying degrees of intensity and duration, have constituted a process, and a process so complicated and so delicate that I question whether modern scientific apparatus directed with the utmost precision, could produce the same result. The white powder you sent me is something very different from the drug you prescribed. It is the powder from which the wine of the Sabbath, the Vinum Sabati, was prepared. No doubt you have read of the witch's Sabbath, and have laughed at the tales which terrified our ancestors, the black cats and the broomsticks, and dooms pronounced against some old woman's cow. Since I have known the truth, I have often reflected that it is on the whole a happy thing that such burlesque as this is believed, for it serves to conceal much that it is better should not be known generally. However, if you care to read the appendix to Payne Knight's monograph, you will find that the true Sabbath was something very different, though the writer has very nicely refrained from printing all he knew. The secrets of the true Sabbath were the secrets of remote times surviving into the Middle Ages, secrets of an evil science, which existed long before Aryan man entered Europe. Men and women, seduced from their homes on specious pretenses, were met by beings well qualified to assume, as they did assume, the part of devils, and taken by their guides to some desolate and lonely place, known to the initiate by long tradition, and unknown to all else. Perhaps it was a cave in some bare and windswept hill, perhaps some inmost recess of a great forest, and there the Sabbath was held. There, in the blackest hour of night, the Vinum Sabati was prepared, and this evil grawl was poured forth and offered to the neophytes, and they partook of an infernal sacrament, Sumentis Calicem Principis Inferorum, as an old author well expresses it and suddenly each one that had drunk found himself attended by a companion, a shape of glamour and unearthly allurement, beckoning him apart, to share in joys more exquisite, more piercing than the thrill of any dream, and the consummation of the marriage of the Sabbath. It is hard to write of such things as these, and chiefly because that shape that allured with loveliness was no hallucination, but awful as it is to express, the man himself. By the power of that Sabbath wine, a few grains of white powder thrown into a glass of water, the house of life was riven asunder, and the human trinity dissolved, and the worm which never dies, that which lies sleeping within us all, was made tangible in an external thing, and clothed with a garment of flesh. And then, in the hour of midnight, the primal fall was repeated and represented, and the awful thing veiled in the mythos of the tree in the garden was done anew. Such was the nuptiae sabati. I prefer to say no more. You, Haberden, know as well as I do that the most trivial laws of life are not to be broken with impunity, and for so terrible an act as this, in which the very inmost place of the temple was broken open and defiled, a terrible vengeance followed. What began with corruption ended also with corruption. Underneath is the following in Dr. Haberden's writing. 
The whole of the above is unfortunately, strictly, and entirely true. Your brother confessed all to me on that morning when I saw him in his room. My attention was first attracted to the bandaged hand, and I forced him to show it me. What I saw made me, a medical man of many years standing, grow sick with loathing. And the story I was forced to listen to was infinitely more frightful than I could have believed possible. It has tempted me to doubt the eternal goodness which can permit nature to offer such hideous possibilities. And if you had not, with your own eyes, seen the end, I should have said to you, disbelieve it all. I have not, I think, many more weeks to live, but you are young and may forget all this. Joseph Haberden, M.D. In the course of two or three months, I heard that Dr. Haberden had died at sea shortly after the ship left England. Miss Lester ceased speaking and looked pathetically at Dyson, who could not refrain from exhibiting some symptoms of uneasiness. He stuttered out some broken phrases expressive of his deep interest in her extraordinary history, and then said with a better grace, But pardon me, Miss Lester, I understood you were in some difficulty. You were kind enough to ask me to assist you in some way. Ah, she said, I had forgotten that. My own present trouble seems of such little consequence in comparison with what I have told you. But as you are so good to me, I will go on. You will scarcely believe it, but I found that certain persons suspected, or rather pretended to suspect, that I had murdered my brother. These persons were relatives of mine, and their motives were extremely sordid ones. But I actually found myself subject to the shameful indignity of being watched. Yes, sir, my steps were dogged when I went abroad, and at home I found myself exposed to constant, if artful, observation. With my high spirit this was more than I could brook, and I resolved to set my wits to work and elude the persons who were shadowing me. I was so fortunate as to succeed. I assumed this disguise, and for some time have lain snug and unsuspected. But of late I have reason to believe that the pursuer is on my track. Unless I am greatly deceived, I saw yesterday the detective who is charged with the odious duty of observing my movements. You, sir, are watchful and keen-sighted. Tell me, did you see anyone lurking about this evening? I hardly think so, said Dyson, but perhaps you would give me some description of the detective in question. Certainly. He is a youngish man, dark with dark whiskers. He has adopted spectacles of large size in the hope of disguising himself effectually, but he cannot disguise his uneasy manner and the quick, nervous glances he casts to left and right. This piece of description was the last straw for the unhappy Dyson, who was foaming with impatience to get out of the house, and would gladly have sworn eighteenth-century oaths if propriety had not frowned on such a course. "'Excuse me, Miss Lester,' he said with cold politeness. I cannot assist you. Ah, she said sadly, I have offended you in some way. Tell me what I have done, and I will ask you to forgive me. You are mistaken, said Dyson, grabbing his hat, but speaking with some difficulty. You have done nothing, but as I say, I cannot help you. Perhaps, he added, with some tinge of sarcasm, my friend Russell might be of service. Thank you, she replied. I will try him and the lady went off into a shriek of laughter, which filled up Mr. Dyson's cup of scandal and confusion. He left the house shortly afterwards, and had the peculiar delight of a five-mile walk, through streets which slowly changed from black to grey, and from grey to shining passages of glory, for the sun to brighten. Here and there he met or overtook strayed revellers, but he reflected that no one could have spent the night in a more futile fashion than himself, and when he reached his home, he had made resolve for reformation. He decided that he would abjure all Milesian and Arabian methods of entertainment, and subscribe to Moody's for a regular supply of mild and innocuous romance.